Hi, it's Robin McMahon here. I'm the host of Parenting Our Future. And if you're listening to this podcast, I want to thank you so much for being here. I also want you to know that I'm a former angry mom. I used to yell and rage and threaten and punish my kids because I wasn't getting the cooperation or the behavior that I felt I should be getting. And I struggled for many years, not knowing how to change or knowing what to do differently. It wasn't until I found the world of peaceful parenting that I learned why my kids acted the way they did and also why I was so angry and triggered. I was able to heal my anger and leave my triggers behind so that I could focus on being the calm and confident parent I always expected myself to be. I can tell you that feeling connected to your kids is the best feeling in the world. My two boys are teenagers now, and we have a strong relationship that is rooted in deep connection. And where there is connection, there's cooperation. Parenting is the most important job we do, but it's the hardest job we do. And we do it without understanding the fundamentals of the way our kids grow and develop. We do it without knowing the way their brains work or what their behavior is actually really telling us. So it's no wonder it's so hard. And it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to say, this is harder than I thought it would be. And that's where I come in. I can help you and I can support you so that you can have the cooperation and enjoy being a parent. You can book a free call with me on my website, parentingforconnection.com. And if you want to download my free guide, how to turn a no into cooperation, go to triggerfreeparents.com. I really hope you enjoy the show. Thanks for listening. Hello, it's Robin McMahon here. Welcome to another episode of Parenting Our Future. I am so excited to bring you an expert in ADHD. So many people that I talk to, so many parents that I work with have a child with ADHD and they are so frustrated with the many different kinds of symptoms that come with ADHD that include things like our kids being lazy sometimes and also being hyperactive, also being inattentive, not being able to regulate emotions, or sometimes even being violent. So I am so happy to introduce you to Melissa Dvorsky. She's a PhD and the Assistant Professor of Pediatrics, Psychiatry, and Behavioral Sciences, and the Director of the ADHD and Learning Differences Program at the Children's National Hospital at the George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Scientists. Whoa, she's a big deal. (laughs) She's also the Director of the ADHD and Learning Differences Program, as well as the Director of the Advanced Tools for Organization Management, which is ADAM, that's the acronym, Uh, which is a school program for teens who struggle with attention and organization. Dr. Dvorsky's research is focused on improving organization and time management skills and promoting long-term improvements in youth and adolescents with ADHD. You've got a kid with ADHD. You definitely want to listen in. Well, thank you so much for being here, Melissa. I just, I just can't even tell you how happy I am to talk to somebody like you about ADHD, because not only do I have a son with ADHD, I have so many clients whose kids have it as well. And so one of the most frustrating parts of ADHD that follows our kids along, and I'm curious how long it is, is the executive functioning piece. The executive functioning piece there, if I'm, if I'm correct, there's eight different areas, right? So we're going to talk today about ADHD. We're going to talk about executive function and we're going to talk just about a few things because I think this is really what makes ADHD so frustrating, right? So Melissa, welcome. Thanks for being here. Let's, let's just, can you define executive functioning and give us the areas that are involved? Yeah. Thank you. And thank you very much for having me excited to be here today. Um, Executive functioning is a really broad construct and depending on who who you ask, there might be eight facets or there might be five or six. Mm. Um, And so depending on kind of what literature you're diving into, I think what's more important though, is to just understand that there are many different facets to it. Um, There are parts of executive function that are responsible for managing emotions, managing your attention, your ability to stay on task. Um, but it's also responsible for behavior regulation and um, kind of controlling those impulsive behaviors in the moment or um, 
controlling your um, motivation too. There are mm. many yeah, facets to it. And they all kind of, um, I think, fall under this broad um, umbrella of, of what in the science we call behavioral inhibition, but it's sort of self-regulation, your ability to control mm. yourself in the moment. So a lot of that has to do with that prefrontal cortex, right? That isn't fully developed yet until our kids are in their mid twenties, essentially. So does it get better? Is there all, all of a sudden, uh, you know, a time where our kids don't need as much help and support? They aren't so disorganized. They aren't so forgetful. They aren't so like, oh, anybody who's listening to this ADHD, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Oh yeah. Like, will it stop? I'm glad you mentioned that, um, the, this question of, does it, um, does it stop and that executive functions, you know, keep growing and keep developing into your mid twenties, because it's important to also know what's, what's typical. And we wouldn't expect a child in early elementary school, for example, to have any executive functioning skills or abilities yet, because that part of their brain hasn't developed. And that's true for all yeah. children. So there is a piece of this that overlines with what's typical for development and yeah. what's typical maybe in someone with ADHD in terms of their executive function. And those are kind of different questions, but um, what we see in individuals, there's actually been studies that have looked at um, repeated brain scans of the frontal lobe um, and typically developing children across um, childhood and into um, adolescents and then of ADHD brains. And they show that the ADHD brain by late adolescence tends to look just like a typically developing brain, but during those childhood years, it can be um, significantly behind and be anywhere from roughly around a third of their age in development compared to um, how, how well developed a typically developing brain is. So there's going to be times what that means is if you have a child with ADHD and elementary school, early middle school, there's going to be times when they present as, you know, two or three grades younger than themselves, even though other times they might be really mature or be able to, um, to handle situations that are tough. And I think that's what makes it challenging for a teacher or a parent isn't kind of interpreting what we know or believe that they're capable of versus mm -hmm. they're not following through with that in the moment in other situations. Well, I can't think of anything scarier than that as a parent, because my goodness, if we, it, I mean, we're, we're all here trying to raise our kids to be good future humans. Right. And, and there's, there's a good and bad part of that. Right. It's good because yes, of course we want to pour into them so that they they live rich, happy, and meaningful lives, but then we're scared to death because you can't even remember to bring home the piece of paper, the one piece of paper I asked you to bring home, let's just say, <laughs> not speaking of my experience at all, um, and you can't even do that, right? Or you know, you just, you can't regulate your emotions. You are so impulsive. You, you know, you can't sit still. So it's like, uh-oh, what do I let go? What do I accept? What do I say, hey, this is going to get better. And what do I say? No, we need some strategies now, right? We need help now. And that as a parent, we do not have a crystal ball. And so it is so frustrating and it's scary, right? Like you must yeah. find parents just like that. <laughs> Yes. And it, and it kind of depends on the day too, because there are good days and there are bad days. I think of ADHD as a very highly variable um, kind of group of individuals because um, depending on kind of what's, what's fallen into place or not fallen into place that day, I think it's important to take sort of a weekly rating of where things are at and how, you know, even if it's just like you make up what one to 10 scale is and you you kind of make an anchor for what a one is for your your child or your family and what a 10 is and kind of take a, a kind of a daily temperature check or a weekly temperature check on how things are going so you get uh, more of a zoomed out picture of do you need help right now and if you're consistently seeing that this is a pattern um because sometimes our own emotions in the moment drive that something seems worse than it is um but if you kind of try to take a, a your own like diary of how things are going you can you can see whether this is just a one off thing you forgot this really important piece of paper and i can't believe you you forgot it or is that just um is that a series of of patterns of events 
or does it feel like a pattern because it was so important? And yeah, um, I, yeah. I, I and I'm thinking it's more like a pattern, right? It's not a one off. This is like an ongoing. Like I just asked you for the one thing, and you couldn't do that either. You know, yeah. either. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that's that's what I mean. And and look, it's frustrating. I I'll tell you, as my son who has ADHD gets older, I notice my husband getting more and more frustrated and worried about him. My husband didn't have a great experience in high school. And I can see him projecting his own fears onto our son and, uh, and, and just worried that, you know, he's not going to be okay. So, you know, I think it's good to know that those brains catch up, which is great. And there's always this part of whenever our kids have challenges, I always think, you know, in a way, it's great that they get to have these challenges as kids, because we're here to help them. And they can get strategies now while they're young that will lead them and stay with them in their life, right? They've got these strategies, whereas somebody that skates through don't ha- doesn't, you know, just sort of naturally is able to, you know, pivot and, and ex- you know, just excel in life. And then things do fall apart when you get older. I mean, it's what happens in life. Unfortunately, things happen, right? And we all face adversity. And if we don't have those, you know, those coping skills, you're, you're at a disadvantage. So this is kind of a great opportunity to really teach this. And I I have to say, I wish this was taught more in school for everybody, not just our kids that have ADHD. Yeah, that's exactly right. I, I always say that, you know, they, they teach, you know, math skills or how to read, but they don't really teach, um, how to organize the calendar or planner or prioritize your goals or plan in advance for a test. That's really important. Um, there aren't specific classes that, that break those skills down or encourage people to practice them. Um, so it's just sort of assumed that by the time you get to high school, you just know how to do, you've developed habits, but from who and from where? Yeah. Yeah. Like nobody ever taught my kids or me how to study, how to actually study. How do you study? Right. I mean, I, 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 you know, I figured it out, but I don't know that there isn't a better way. And so then I teach my kids my, you know, the way I know. Uh, Anyway, so uh, I won't digress into all of that. So, okay. So if we're talking about executive functioning, we're talking about organization, emotion, attention, being able to stay on task, uh, behavior regulation, motivation in a lot of cases, like a lot of these ADHD kids also opt out, right? And that's a big warning sign too. Like they do nothing. So what are, you know, when, when families come to you and work with you, what are some of the biggest challenges that they're facing and and how do you guide them through that? Yeah. One, one challenge that you kind of alluded to earlier was how much do I intervene versus Mm. how do I, you know, there's sort of the two types of, of parenting patterns, which can be Helicopter parenting is, a, is a, a bad term for it, but kind of overly stepping in to kind of catch your child every single time they might fall to prevent, you know, you see that they forgot their lunch, so you drive out of your way to go take it to them or um, kind of solving their their problems as they come up. Or there could be the, the kind of the, you're burnt out on, on solving those problems and now you're mm-hmm. under-involved and um, kind of like sink or swim, you're on your own, figured out you're old enough you know, that sort of, oh my gosh, pattern. So true. Wow. That's so true. I won't tell you which. And sometimes it waffle. Yeah. Between both. Cause you're like, I'm not sure which is the right one to do. And, and that's also confusing for your kid because like, mom, you drove me my lunch to me like last week. Why can't you do it today? Because you're old enough and you should be doing this yourself. Right. I'm getting it. So confusing. Okay. So that's, that's so true. And so you're saying, well, there's, there has to be a, a balance of both, right? I love Dr. Dan Siegel. He calls it push or cushion, right? Whether you push your kids to, to do it, to make mistakes, to fall, to fail, because failure is a shared human condition. And for us to be a figure of stability and a safe place for our kids that when they do fail and, and, and fall flat on their face, that we're there to just support them, help them through it, not judge them, criticize them, make fun of them. None of that stuff. We are just there as trusting allies for them. Right. And then that whole helicopter. Yeah. The helicopter piece is about fear. The opting out is exhaustion. I mean, you know, I look at, I can identify with the, with the burnout, not opting out, sorry, the burnout, you know, my son is 17 
And that's a long time to have a child with ADHD who, who has a severe case of ADHD, plus learning disabilities, plus he has oppositional defiance, plus he has obsessive compulsive disorder. I mean, it is a lot. It's a lot. And I understand that burnout. Yeah. Yeah. Two key words that I always stick to are um, consistency mm -hmm. and uh, gradually. So think about kind of where they're at now, like you said, they're, they have the safety net of home right now. So how can we get them to gradually work towards whatever that goal is that we want them to be doing independently and do it? We know they need some of our support now. So how can we give them that support and then gradually you know, pull it back um, and let them learn it now while they're at home during middle school and high school, get those, those experiences before then they leave the home and um, they, they truly are on their own to figure it out during adolescence is a great time to practice those, um, those things. And what matters most rather than picking a side on either of those sides is that we are kind of really gradually shaping their behavior, meaning in the middle and sort of wherever that middle line is for what your child needs. And mm -hmm. then trying to stay consistent to your, to your parenting style. Mm -hmm. Um, so not letting like your stress in the mo moment impact how, you whether you do step in or don't step in but make it more about what your child needs um mm. yeah 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 it's and, and and that can cause that burnout right is is our kids might be resistant i mean if you if you, you know adhd usually comes with a friend right and so if your kids are resistant they might not even want to learn that stuff so this is such a big a big a, just a really big area uh, with lots of different challenges. And you're right. Like it's so unique to each child and some kids will show their ADHD in very different ways than another child with ADHD. And I think it's really, really interesting that you talk about how some kids can present two to three grades younger, which is really tough when they're in school. If they are that way, because school is such a place of heartbreak, is such a place of struggle, such a place of like, you know, not feeling like you're belonging. And our kids need that in those teen years. They need to belong. They need to have, you know, those social interactions and ADHD can really hold them back. And that's really like that, that makes my heart hurt. Yeah, it's true that when you think about, um, you know, one thing that, that's sort of hard hard to put out there, but it's, it's a, it's true is that so much comorbidity, you know, ADHD is rarely on its own, whether there's a co-occurring learning difference or whether it's anxiety or depression. And in some of my work with some older young adults, it's, it's hard sometimes to come across an individual that doesn't also have co-occurring depression or anxiety. Yeah. And can you possibly, you know, blame them when you start to think about how much they've gotten corrective feedback throughout their childhood and, um, continuing from, from their parents, from their teachers, from their Ugh. coaches, from it's their friends. Um, and, and if they don't have other outlets or other things that they can find in their life that they can excel at with, with mm -hmm. less effort, um, mm -hmm. you know, that's so important find whatever is inherently fun, interesting, or that they're good at. It might be athletics. It might be scouting or crafts or, mm. or art or, or musicals or, but finding something that that really drives their passion that that yeah. um yeah that's so important for that self-efficacy yes oh my gosh that's so true my son loves animals and so we've done volunteering at animal shelters I had to go with him because he was too young to do it on his own but yeah like that that's such a great point because they need wins they need wins right they need to like something that they can be proud of for themselves that they know that they're good at. So I love, love, love that you said that. I think that is so important. And yeah, feedback, they're getting constant feedback, you know, from everybody, like you just said, that maybe they're not good enough. And that's really hard on a child, especially in those teen years, right? And that's when they do tend to opt out too, right? And we don't want that for them. We want them to do their best. So let me ask you then, you have the most brilliant website, which is in the show notes, but it's, uh, it's Melissa And, um, and, and here's where I want to, I want to ask you next. So 
for the parents listening, I, I really want to make sure they know what to do and have resources. And that's why I'm mentioning your website right now, because you have so many resources and they are so beautifully done and laid out. And so you have organizing materials, you have planning for tests and projects, homework recording, engaging teens with ADHD. You have all of these different resources that are a part of Adam, which is advanced tools for organization, uh, organization management. So Adam, love it. And, and so I want to ask you, you know, is this something that are these tools, something that parents can take home work with their kids on, but can they also share it with the teacher and say, Hey, look, like, can we do this together to help our, our child. Yes, exactly. Um, they should be used in a multitude of ways and we're, we're growing our resources right now and eventually um, hope to have some different categories of specific tools for, for the student audience, specific to caregivers and then specific to our community partners and, and teachers. And um, But certainly the, the materials that are up there can be, can be shared with others and um, a lot of the strategies that we work on in our clinical setting with fam- with families or parents are very similar in nature to the classroom behavioral management or strategies that you might use one-on-one when trying to um, motivate a child with, with staying on top of their, their homework management at school too. So um, they are, they are useful across, across those settings. That's great. And you don't just have your own resources. You have resources from all over, which I really love, right? So we're getting a real, a, just, you've got to check it out. It's so good, everybody. Like I'm going to be downloading stuff, to, you know, constantly because it's so important. And so, um, you know, here's here's something that that comes up, right? So we're, we're really talking about school. We're talking about you know, how, how kids can be more organized, plan better, that sort of thing. How about the behavior piece though? That's really the hardest one. When, when, when I see kids and I see many, many kids like this who are so dysregulated that they can be violent, that they can, you know, punch walls, put holes in walls, break their doors down. You know, they're just, they're, they're, really struggling. What is that about? Let's sort of talk like why it gets to that point and what do we do for those kids? Yeah, that's really hard. It can, it can be a lot of different things. Sometimes that's a behavioral representation of a true mood concern, you know, Mm. mood and depression in children can sometimes and often looks like irritability, not feeling, Mm -hmm. not looking sad. Um, so it's important to think about, um, Kind of whether this is a, a mood concern or whether it's a um, a behavioral concern, rarely, um, I'd say more often these things get labeled as oppositional or conduct disorder. Yeah. When um, when it's truly just um, a, a, um, a misrepresentation of these are my emotions and I don't know what to do with them. Yeah. Or yeah. yeah or or even like I'm that was just really impulsive. I really messed up, you know, true oppositional or conduct disorders really are oppositional defiance disorders are really about kind of this willful desire to defy authority, which some that is, you know, does co-occur with ADHD too. And that can, that can be some of the cases, but if it's not, if they immediately after regret, Oh, I did, I did that. And I feel bad about it. Yeah. Or, um, then that says to me that that was impulsive, an impulsive reaction in that in that moment, and they need help with coping skills to to better regulate those in, those in the moment and to recognize when they're going they're escalating. Sometimes it does happen just like that. It's so fast, and so it's hard to predict. But learn helping them to learn about what are the situations that that um, sort of trigger that intense emotion for you. So they can practice the coping skills before something happens again. Okay. That is really good. Yeah. So, so what you said is it could be mood. It could be behavior. It could also be depression because depression is often disguised as anger, right. And, Mm -hmm. and aggressiveness, especially in boys. Do I have that right? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, and, and so it can be mes- misrepresented as oppositional defiance disorder or conduct disorder when actually it's your child who, depending on their age and where their brain development is at, doesn't know how to understand their emotions, doesn't know how to deal with them and doesn't know how to articulate them. So it comes out as behavior we don't like that we want to punish. And when we punish it, we get further and further away from what's actually driving it. Right. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm glad we're on the because yeah, it's, it's what I tell my clients all the time. And it's what we talk about all the time. Like it really is about going, okay, hold on a second. I'm going to take this behavior. I'm going to put it over here for a minute, just put it over here, like put it to the side and just look at you and see what's going on with you. What is going on? And when we can figure out what's really going on, oftentimes that behavior dissolves or lessons, right? And then we've got to give them those coping skills. So what kind of coping skills do you give kids like this when they are, because you said um, oftentimes they, they, are reg- they, they are remorseful, they regret it, they, they feel bad about it, which, you know, I know that's so true, right? They don't want to be like that. They don't, like, it's not fun for anybody, right? When, like our, our child doesn't want to be like that, to be out of control, right? I mean, I think for anybody listening, when was the last time you were out of control? that's scary. That does not feel good. So, so we have this, they've done the thing and they're remorseful, but then there's also preventing that trigger from happening. So we don't even have to go there. And I love that. And then there's also the, Oh, oh, we're ramping up. Okay. How do we stop this? So what do you say, how do we prevent it and how do we lessen it slash stop it as it's happening? Yeah. On the preventing end, we, I think learning about yourself and the situations where these things happen. So really taking the time to reflect on what was happening. What were some of the other, like I call them antecedents, but what are the context clues that were going on? Oh, I didn't eat breakfast. Uh, I was up too late studying the night before. And so I was also tired. What can, what are all the factors that contributed to that be- reaction being outside of your typical self? Um, yeah. And And then that can give you signals to some things that you could change or handle differently. It could also be, I really don't like this person and I have to sit next to them in this class and they're always doing this annoying thing. And so um, identifying that and okay, and that we all have to deal with people that we are annoyed or don't like sometimes and finding a way to either um, cope with that, something you can say in your head, like a mantra of I'll get through this, it's only 15 more minutes of this class, or um, sometimes it is just recognizing that's what bothers me and I, it's okay to step away and, and remove myself if that's an option too. Kind of taking your, yourself away from those, um, those things that are, are going to make you more upset. Okay. Yeah. You want to be careful. Yeah. Not to avoid too much. Cause sometimes if someone has inherent um, anxiety tendencies, you might avoid the things that bother you, but yeah, trying to recognize the, the emotions and the impact of them. Okay. So, so, okay. So first, when we talk about um, the first part that you said, so as parents, looking at our child, our, their big display of emotion, of big behavior, of whatever, whatever it is that they did, right? Maybe they destroyed something, whatever you want to look at. Okay. Let me just take my emotion out of it. Like without judgment, right. Without criticism, have a look at the situation. What happened, what was happening in that moment? What happened before? And let me see if I can piece this together. Uh, what, and, and this will help me next time something like this happens to say, Oh, Hey, hang on a second. It looks like you might be hangry. Hang on one sec. Let's have something to eat. Right. Is that, that's what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, so then in the moment that your child is raging though, is there something that you suggest to parents to do? Yeah. In the moment, um, it kind of depends on the age and the size of, of your child and what really you can do. Sometimes just giving your child space um, is the best thing that you can do in that moment until they come back down. There's 
if they are really um, emotionally activated and upset in that moment, um, it might not matter what you do, but you could make it worse. And so totally, if we, you know, just sort of direct them to a place where they can go and cool down. And um, that's typically the best thing you do. I like to talk about, you know, older kids timeout is not, you know, not a term you use even in elementary school, really. But I like this um, sort of cool down spot or mm. um, sort of relaxation corner, something like a comfy, cozy place that you can go to when you are upset just to calm down in order to then have this conversation. Because one thing we all know is that 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 conversation about what was happening, what was going on, how could you do things differently is never going to fly when they're frustrated in the moment. You need to wait until they've calmed down and are ready to talk about that, that um, but not expect that in the moment. Um, mm-hmm. So it's kind of just taking a break, taking a, a taking a break away. where it's not punitive. It's just a, a here. You, you need a break here. Here's here's a place that is safe that is enjoyable, that's cozy or however, whatever it is that you want, that is yeah. your space to calm down because we all have big, emo- we all have emotions and sometimes, you know, we, we, we need help. And, and this is also where practicing those tools ahead of time on how to calm down really come into play, like square breathing, like grounding exercises, right? What do you teach? Yeah, I like I like the square breathing, deep breathing. Um, there, are, there's also sort of visual visualization strategies that you can do kind of in the moment, especially if you're going to that like relaxation corner. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, apps like Headspace or Calm that kind of will visually walk you through those are great because you oh, don't have nice. to yeah. put too much effort into it. You know, you just put push the audio on. Um, those can be used preventatively, you know, like every day you just do an act, do a breathing activity, or they can be used in that moment when you need it. We know that people are going to be more likely to use it in the moment when they need it. If they practiced it, you're, you know, exactly going to be in front of mind that way. Um, but I think another tool is really just labeling your feelings. Um, you know, I, I like to use like a zero to a 10 scale, but, and, and do check-ins like, Hey, what's, what's your emotion thermometer like right now? Or Mm. what was the highest or lowest it was today? And what happened, you know, when you're checking in about your day, instead of just asking, what did you learn in school today? Like what, what was your high and low and what was going on that that's going to help to kind of, and then using that as a parent talking about yourself, like I'm at a seven right now, I need to go to the bathroom and just close the door and I'll be out in 15 minutes. And then we can talk you using it, modeling it yourself too, just to really, learn to recognize, okay, I'm a seven, I'm coming an eight. I definitely don't want anyone to see me when I'm at a nine. I don't want to see myself at a nine. So I'm going to kind of learning where, how those numbers quickly, you know, jump will help to mm. recognize when you need to take a, take a minute. Mm, I like that. It, it, it almost takes the, well, it takes the judgment out of it. It takes, I want to say the emotion out of it, but the emotion, uh, which is the judgment out of it, because it's like, I'm just a number like, yeah, no, I don't want to get to a 10 and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty close. Like I'm at an eight right now. So I'm going to go do what I need to do. And that's like to calm myself down. And I'm saying that as a parent. And I think when you speak in the language of feelings and needs and model that with your kids, that's really important. Like I'm feeling this, I need to go and do this. And it's not about you. It's me. I'm feeling really agitated right now. And because our kids co-regulate off of us too, it's powerful. Our kids don't do what we say. They do what we do. Right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and I okay. also just, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. I just, I want to normalize too that, you know, a 16, 17 year old at home might not be that interested in talking to mom about these things on a regular basis. If you already have an open relationship, that may be the case. But I, I know that it's naive to think that every teenager is going to want to talk to their parents about this. And so if this is something that's occurring often and they really need support for, then it might be time to find either a counselor in school or a therapist um, in the community that can talk with your, your child about these things Um, because they, it, you know, teenagers typically don't love to talk with their parents about these sorts of things, but they may open up um, just by having it be someone else who's not mom or dad or, or my caregiver, you know, asking me, um, 
That's a really good point. It's a really good point. And you and I were talking before we hit record and you said that it's really the younger kids where you just work with the parents because the parents really are the most influential people in those kids' lives, right? At that age. But as our kids get older, and if we've had a bad experience with ADHD, if we have reacted in a way that's actually made it worse, unbeknownst to us, right? Like I always say, it's hard enough to raise a typical child, never mind a child with extra needs. Nobody tells you how to do that. You know, that's, it's so hard. And so every parent listening, please know, like we get it, we get how hard it is. And there does come a time where other people might be more influential temporarily for your child. And it's a good idea to get them some help and support. So, and it actually takes the pressure off of you a little bit too. So it's really a win-win it's like, yeah, you go, you go to the counselor and, and talk through that. That's fine with me. Yeah. 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 And that's what you do. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I think this mood and, um, and anxiety and social experiences, they all tie into motivation and your engagement in school and, and, and your conflict with parents too. It all sort of intermingles. And sometimes there's, um, there might be, sometimes we find ourselves like in too much of a pattern. Like I'm always just asking you about how many more missing assignments do you have? Or, um, and that's all that we talk about. And we, so finding, I think it's easier if you, if you have more of a whole, um, if you have other roles and if someone else is supporting your child in that way, then it also frees up space for you to just hang out with your child and talk to them, um, about other things too, and build more positive experiences for them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think some of these conversations are tough. Yeah, that's such a good point. You do get into that, into that, place where, especially like my son's in grade 12, right. Where I'm like, okay, how are we doing? How are we, you know, I, I, and, and it, it's so true. Like, I don't want to be talking to the teacher. I want you to be talking to the teacher. This is your job. You should be able to do this. Right. So I like, I am totally p- picking up what you're putting down and, uh, and yeah, it's, um, yeah, it, it, you know, it really does take a team. You need your teachers involved. You need, you know, your child involved. You need to be involved. Make sure that there's wins. I love that you said to make sure that there's wins. You know, I think you have to give yourself some grace. You give your child some grace. Know that when kids are in turmoil, they do provoke turmoil but that there's a reason why nobody wants to be that way. Nobody wants to be that way, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I, I want to talk about what you have in the parent toolbox for us, which is so great. You have infographics. Um, it, it's a resource on organization, time management skills for, for children and for adolescents. And you also have um, a video as well. So please go to the parent toolbox. It's www.parent-toolbox.com. And, uh, and please download Melissa's resources there. And then you go to melissadvorsky.com and it's D-V-O-R-S-K-Y. Uh, and uh, just so you know, uh, and she just, I'm telling you, you've got to see this website. It's so good. I'm going to point all of my clients to your website. I'm also going to put in the show notes, some other discussions that I've had about ADHD, about neurodivergent kids, about executive functioning as well, because I have talked about this before. And the more we learn and understand, I think the more compassionate we can be, the more patient we are. And, uh, and I'd love to turn it over to you and just ask you, you know, one, really one last question. What do you want parents to know about their ADHD child? You know, is there one thing that you can say that just helps us really with the overall challenge of ADHD? I think um, I'm going to pitch that question back to you in my response, I guess, and say that there isn't one answer, Mm. but you as a parent come to the table, you know, I'm a psychologist and I work with families all the time and I study ADHD and attention and neurodiversity, but that doesn't make me an expert in your child at all. You're the expert Mm. in your child. And remember that, remember that you know them best. Mm -hmm. Um, you've been parenting them. And, and so take kind of advice that you give from, from folks that you work with and and specialists that you might be helping you and blend that with your own family, either culture or experience or, or what you know about your, your individual child, but, 
I just want to empower families to, to know that, um, that's yeah, that they know their child best in terms of how, what they need. That's a really good point. And it is really true. You know, I, and I, and I always hear parents say, Oh, but, but, but they are a really great kid, you know, like she's just a great kid or he's just a great kid. Like there's these beautiful sides to them. And it's like, we just got to help them get through the muck and get through it and, you know, fight the fight with them, you know, and they will be okay. Right. They'll be okay. And, um, yeah, I, I just, uh, I really appreciate the work you're doing. We need it. Uh, like us moms and dads, we really do need it. It is tough. And, uh, and I just want to thank you so much, Melissa, for being here, for sharing these resources and for helping parents just like me. <laughs> Thanks yeah. so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this edition of my podcast, Parenting Our Future. I'm parent coach Robin McMahon. And if you're enjoying this podcast, please share it with someone who you think might also need to hear this message. And don't forget to subscribe. And if you like my work, I'd be grateful if you gave me a five-star rating. For those of you who like my content and want more, visit me at yellingcurebook.com to get your copy of my book and to find other resources to help you. Until next time, I am wishing you and your family peace and connection.